and welcome to this third edition of the Euronaval Talks. As many of you know by now, this is a new series of events that the Euronaval team has decided to create to keep the conversation going in between two iterations of the Euronaval show, which takes place in Paris, where we are today. And the commitment is that every three months, more or less, we convene four subject matter experts to discuss the latest hot and sometimes challenging topics trending in the naval domain. And today is no exception. In fact, we are aware that having chosen to discuss today the subject of European defense cooperation, industry cooperation in the naval domain, we may be treading into quite complex waters sometimes. But that is why I am being joined today by a really excellent team of experts that will be discussing this topic with us. We felt that with the war in Ukraine nearing two years now, uh, it was, and so many conversations having taken place uh, about European defense, what it means, what the European institutions do or don't do to, co to foster this cooperation. It was, it was really important to also have a naval perspective on the matter. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you the uh, speakers we have with us today. And I will start with Marc Robert, the Policy Officer Industry Engagement who, uh, at the European Defence Agency, who is going to have the very difficult task today of answering all my questions about DEDA, what it is, what it does, and how it's contributing to European defence industry cooperation. Hi, Marc. Hi, good afternoon, Alex. Uh, very happy to, to be here. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Um, then we have with us also Paula Alvarez Cusero, a uh, foresight analyst at the strategy division of Navantia. And with Paula, we're going to be having a more of an overview of European defence industry and the state of affairs in terms of cooperation challenges, opportunities, and sort of what this means going forward. Hi, Paola. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, my pleasure. And then on my right here, we have um, Stefano Bertuzzi, Head of Naval System and MBDA, and Cecilia Aguero, who is Sales Director France and EU for Thales. And both of you are going to be giving us the perspective of the industry on this matter. So what does it mean to be cooperating with other industry partners in Europe on naval uh, projects? Hi to you both. Good afternoon. Pleasure being with you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Delighted to be here with you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be all with all of you today. Now, before we dig into this uh, very hot topic once again, I would like to remind our audience that you have a chance to participate in the topic as well, in the conversation by asking questions on the platform that you're using um, to watch this live. I will be receiving them on the screen here and I will be asking them as the conversation moves along and we'll do our best to answer your questions. And now, without further ado, I would like to start the conversation with you, Marc. And um, so, you know, European Defence Agency, I mean, up until a few years ago, a few people actually knew you even existed or what it was. So could you perhaps tell us a bit more about, you know, what's the relationship of the EDA with the other European institutions and what's your mission? Absolutely. So thank you for the occasion for us to explain the role of EDA <laughs> because, as you mentioned, it was kind of a specialist uh, affair until recently. Um, the EDA so was created in 2004, uh, first of all, and uh, it has the, the very particular, particular aspect of having this kind of dual uh, line of command, this kind, kind of hybrid uh, character to it. Basically, our head of agency is the HRVP of the European Union, so Joseph Borrell. Uh, but the way we are managed is that we are basically uh, controlled uh, very directly by a steering board uh, composed of the ministries of defense of all uh, the European Union uh, member states. Um, so we have this, this um, uh, I would say, particular design uh, that uh, allow us to be really in touch uh, directly with aspiration from, from member states uh, and their ministries of defense. Uh, so the, um, the role of EDA is really to be uh, an enabler of, of uh, projects of cooperation uh, within member states. Just to go quickly on how EDA works at on the inside. Yes, huh? please. <laughs> uh, we have basically four uh, directorates. Uh, so the first is um, uh, RTI, so Research Technology Innovation. Mm -hmm. 
which deals with the CapTech communities, which is kind of the uh, well-known produce in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, which are working groups that work on, on, on R&T projects for member states. Uh, we have the CAP, so Capability Armament and Planning mm -hmm. Directorate, that deals with the card process, for example. Uh, also is the main actor of the CDP, which is the Capability uh, Development Plan, which is also a, a tool for co coherence in, in planning in, in Europe. You have the ISC Directorate, Energy, Syna uh, Synergy, uh, Industry Synergy and Enablers, mm -hmm. from which I'm from. Okay. Uh, and then you have the CSD Corporate Services Directorate, uh, which has the support mission, but also deals with procurement, which now is more, more and more being a, a bigger a work strand, I would say, within the agency. Mm. So yeah, to summarize, uh, the, the agency is here to uh, push for cooperation, enhance cooperation between member states, very pragmatically project-oriented, output-oriented, I would say, uh, but is also there to be, I would say, the voice of defense at EU level within the organization, uh, within, with the commission, in relation with the commission. Of course, we work, we work uh, with very uh, close link uh, with the commission and the rest of the institution uh, in, inside of the EU. Right, so already many questions on what you of said. Um, the first one I wanted to ask was, with all the European institutions that are out there, how, do you, how, how does the EDA fit? How do you cooperate with the other institutions and tools and everything on uh, your matters? So if you take, for example, uh, well, we will be basically involved uh, to give our expertise on, 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 on defense on most, if not all, initiatives that relate to defense at EU level. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning when the commission, for example, draft a regulation, uh, for example, uh, most recently ASAP, for example, we are associated to, to this to, uh, to provide expertise and, um, and be able to guide the process and also uh, make uh, member states' uh, opinions uh, heard in the matters. Uh, we are also, for example, if you take um, European Defence Fund, uh, while uh, we, we, we are also, I would say, uh, uh, an observer, I would say an informed observer, uh, we will give, uh, give guidance mm -hmm. uh, for, for the selection of the topics and the grants allocation and so on and so forth. And we have also, I would say, this overarching coherence uh, role where we are there also to try to manage that PESCO, EDF, uh, everything, the CDP, that kind of everything uh, keeps uh, in a good, good music, in good uh, harmony mm -hmm. uh, at EU level, so that there's no useless duplications or that everything really goes uh, in the same direction. So that's, that's I would say, uh, if, if I go still big picture, yeah, yeah. that's what I would say. So it's kind of like, is it fair to say you're sort of the conductor of like all defense related matters? I, you know, I, I wouldn't go that far because, yeah. for example, if you take regulation aspect, so mm. EDA doesn't have the power to, 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 to regulate, mm -hmm. basically. So we will always be there to guide mm -hmm. because we have this very deep expertise. We are very big experts on every domain, technological domain capacity, everything. So we'll be always there to guide, but then, uh, uh, for example, uh, big regulations such as ASAP, uh, EDIRPA, uh, done by the, the commissions, it's not in our field per se, we are contributor. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't say we are leading everything. We are giving the input mm -hmm. and, and uh, acting as the voice of defense yeah. as, as much as possible in all related initiatives. OK, yeah, makes sense. Thank you. So as industry engagement you know, uh, policy officer yeah. at the EDA, uh, you, you, I'm assuming you have to coordinate not just so much industry across Europe, but also like so many different interests with all the member states and so many different um, pressing matters that may not always be the same. So what is your role? What do you do? So um, as a in, if I go into my role particularly, and I would go into the, the job of my team, mm -hmm. the industry team, our role is really to, uh, to be in a, in a transversal fashion, to be of help of all the other activity of the agency. For example, if you have uh, a project uh, that is being driven uh, in the, by the CAP directorate, we are here also to assist, to help with the way industry is going to integrate into the process. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, I would say, three uh, lines of, of action, uh, mostly. Uh, so we, we do um, uh, engagement, I would say, uh, which can be uh, also synonym with like uh, networking. So we, we organize workshop. We had um, an industry workshop um, 10 days ago uh, in which we have every, every basically all in European industry is, is invited. We have national uh, defense industry associations, cluster, but also uh, 
companies coming directly to, to this workshop mm -hmm. to, uh, to, have to engage with us and so we can keep them posted on our initiatives. Um, and we try also to, um, to, to do as much as possible to connect uh, European industry with a company with themselves. Okay. So for example, we have a B2B platform uh, online on our website, so I can use this to be a, a bit of marketing. <laughs> and uh, I would urge uh, companies to, to go and see this, uh, this platform. Uh, this platform is very pragmatic uh, and, and project oriented as all EDA is basically. It's a platform in which you can register and then try to find partners at your level to, uh, to, uh, to do things together. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, another type of the work trend is basically we have this, um, I would say, direct action to support industry. Uh, for example, one very sensitive topic uh, nowadays in the defense industry is access to finance uh, and also everything that is related to ESG, for example, compliance. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were uh, very, uh, we, we, we drove a, a process that led a few weeks ago to a joint statement by the ministers of defense uh, to incite, to call for uh, uh, in a finance uh, institution to, to basically to lend, to, to be at, uh, uh, to help defense industry really d keep developing. Uh, so this is something we will do that are really, would say, very concrete push to try to help the industry. Uh, and we also have a big work trend in analysis, mm -hmm. basically uh, uh, trying to understand the landscape the industrial landscape, uh, draw conclusions and find a way the, to, to, to make this help uh, member states and industry. So the biggest uh, for that would be the, the KSAs. It's one of the big, uh, I would say, landmark. It's one of the big activity of the agency, the key strategic activities uh, in which we will basically take um, um, a theme, uh, a technology called domain. And we will really um, try to, to, to understand the whole industrial landscape, whether it's uh, R&T, uh, manufacturing capabilities in this domain, mm -hmm. uh, but also skills, whether or not we have the, the workforce is prepared to, to tackle this type of subject and also try to detect uh, extra European uh, dependencies, mm -hmm. which is a big aspect actually of this work strain is to understand how we can build European industrial strategic autonomy and, uh, and where is it critical to act, I would say, uh, fast. Mm. So um, I would say basically the, that's, that's what we do. We have a lot more things going, of course, <laughs> yeah. but uh, but for the the main mock trade and the unit, that that, that would be that would be it. Yeah. Okay, well, that's already quite a <laughs> yeah. broad spectrum yeah. that you're uh, you're capturing there. So, when you're trying to understand all this industry landscape and what's going on on the ground, I'm assuming you're also interacting with the industry, getting information from them to see to kind of take the pulse, presumably as well, right? Oh, absolutely, uh, industry is always uh, industry and member states are consulted through every process that we do. Um, if you take the KSA of which I just talked, basically when we, the industry is, is basically consulted at every step of the process, mm -hmm. whether it's when you, we chose the topic, uh, we have a first, I would say, reflection on the inside, then we have f uh, input from member state, then we circulate to industry, then we actually do the work, then it goes back to industry, we mm -hmm. can give inputs and, and add depth um, to, the, to the paper, to the report. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a good example. Industry, uh, I mean, in my, uh, uh, in my unit, is very central to our DNA. Mm -hmm. to be always feeling the pulse of the industry, being connected to, to the industry, being also uh, an open door to which industry can go to, yeah. to, to be able to better relate to, I would say, the broader uh, EU regulation uh, universe landscape, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so no, absolutely, connection with industry is paramount. Okay. Now, I want to preface my next question by saying that I am aware that you don't represent everything MBDA and Talis, so you are free to tell me that you may not have an answer to my question. But based on everything that Mark was telling us, do you know, like, have you felt more engagement from the EDA? Have you, have you managed to use some of the tools that he was talking about or others uh, that he may not have talked about? In fact, we were at the EDA workshop uh, two weeks ago. Okay. Uh, my CEO was there. Okay. giving an explanation right. on how we work, etc. What is the level of investment of MBDA, the search for cooperation in Europe, etc. So we were there. I think it was very useful because that's the way also you understand each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in Thales as well, we, uh, we are familiar with uh, everything that you explain, including the uh, B2B platform. Uh, yes. It's a way for us to find uh, partners, especially smaller partners that we are not so mm. used to. So it's, it's, it's really a good tool and also involved in uh, EDF project uh, and, uh, and CapTech as well. Discussion. Mm. Great. 
Yeah, so in a way, it's, it's also quite good because we all know that at Euronaval you also have, or other shows, of course, but we are at Euronaval today. Mm -hmm. um, you have these little corners as well, these little areas where you can talk to smaller uh, partners, but you have to wait two years to get there. So this is also a good way to have access more regularly and better engagement. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. As far as I've understood from the speech, it's also the fact that uh, we encounter every year uh, roughly 200 companies, SME or labs, etc., in MBDA, and we engage with 10% of them every day. So every year, so mm -hmm. it means new companies, uh, new labs uh, every year. Mm -hmm. so it means now we are picking the, the best of Europe everywhere, yeah. trying to cooperate, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. right. That's a, it's a, it's a key uh, it's a key uh, figure, two hundred uh, yeah, a year. That's pretty good. Yeah. New ones. Yeah. <laughs> so it means that uh, it's lively huh, yeah. Yeah. in Europe. Yeah. The ecosystem is uh, living. Yeah, yeah the vibrant. ecosystem is uh, is working. And plus, I think it's structured by the EU, etc. And uh, it's true that what is the most difficult is the acronym, so. We are <laughs> yes. Such as ASAP. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I discovered ASAP two weeks ago. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is <laughs> not as soon as possible. <laughs> no, it's not as soon as it's possible. Not, not and uh, they're using a lot of acronym. So if yes. you are not part of the system, sometimes it's very difficult to yeah. figure out what they're talking about. What is ASAP? It's, <laughs> it's uh, to procure. It's Munition, the act to support uh, ammunition production. Right. It's a direct consequence of the war in Ukraine. Yeah. The goal is to be able to identify bottleneck at EU level, at industry, to be able to ramp up uh, the production of ammunition, yeah. especially heavy yeah. ammunition, uh, 155 millimeter caliber, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Or missiles. Yeah. Or missiles as well, yeah. Okay. In case it's needed. Yeah. <laughs> MBDA speaking. <laughs> 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 now, Paula, I know you're here mostly as an analyst today, but you do also work for Navantia. So uh, what about from the part of, from the Navantia side? Have you had much interaction with the EDA? Yeah, absolutely. And actually from my role is quite key to understand um, everything, not only the EDA is using, but all the instruments uh, the European Union is putting in into play uh, to be able to increase cooperation and or increase uh, just the role of the defense industry. Um, and so there's a there's been a lot going on uh, recently, but especially in the last few years. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the EDA. And that's the channel that they're, 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 they're taking a lot of these initiatives through. So absolutely. That's good. So good feedback. Yeah, okay. yeah great <laughs> feedback. I wasn't expecting that much. Right. So you mentioned, uh, rightly so, the war in Ukraine. So yes. um, as we all know, unfortunately, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk of European defence, what war at our doorstep means. Um, have you seen changes? How has that impacted the EDA, your work, but also the European defence landscape since then? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's a it's big change. It's a change of era, basically. Uh, mm. The defense, uh, European defence, there really a before and after uh, the Ukraine war. Um, and uh, it, it has affected, I would say, the whole scope of EU defence initiatives. Uh, for us at EDA, uh, we, we adjusted the capability development plan, so this, this big overarching capability development uh, coherence tool that we have between member states, we updated it uh, to take into account the, the new realities and also the, re the return from the ground and ground operations from what we can understand from it. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, from the naval domain, I think it's, uh, we added um, uh, maritime uh, awareness, underwater surveillance and uh, naval interdiction. Mm. Uh, also watching what happened in the, in the Black Sea with the Russian fleet. <laughs> so um, it has really shaken up the whole ecosystem. Um, we've been a part of uh, the numerous uh, commissions initiative on, this on, the, on the topic. So ASAP is one, uh, but EDIRPA is connected also to, to it, which is EDIRPA, so I don't know the full acronym, but it's reinforcement of uh, the industrial base through joint procurement, mm. basically. Okay. Um, and uh, also the future uh, EDIS, another acronym, <laughs> uh, European <laughs> Defense Industry Strategy, okay. which is also, in, uh, I would say, is, is growing in the wake of the war in Ukraine. Uh, for us at EDA, it, has, it had had uh, very concrete also consequences because we've been very closely uh, attached to one of the, I would say, a bigger initiative at EU level, which is uh, the so-called free track approach for uh, uh, ammunition mm -hmm. replenishment, because as you know, uh, uh, Ukrainian forces are firing uh, 
the, the, the figures are varying, but it's, it's 7,000 to 10,000 uh, uh, 155 millimeter shell per, per day, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was an urgent need to replenish the stock to provide them with some help. Uh, and uh, uh, under the initiative of the HRVP, Joseph Borrell, uh, a tree track approach was decided, one uh, which aimed to uh, help member states uh, uh, transfer munition to Ukraine mm -hmm. and that get reimbursement from the European Peace Facility. Mm -hmm. Second track, which, we, which is joint procurement of ammunition, concrete. And the third one, which is ASAP, basically. Mm -hmm. And we are in charge of the second track. So uh, for EDA, it means that in a matter of a few months, we had to basically adapt and, and create this very ambitious process uh, out of uh, not much mm -hmm. to try to buy uh, ammunition uh, on the entire I for, uh, with the entirety of the European industrial base, basically. And not only we were we buying everywhere, mm -hmm. but we were also buying for four different uh, platforms, for four different filing systems, which is very, uh, some of you know contra armament contracts, it's quite rare, it's quite yeah. hard to manage. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, EDA was able to tackle this challenge. And uh, as of now, we have uh, nine framework contracts uh, signed and uh, seven member states are already procuring through this alley. So, um, so for us, EDA, very, a very transformative time. Mm. Uh, for sure, because mm -hmm. we are at the forefront of everything that is defense related and we had to really even adapt who we are a bit uh, uh, through, through this process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, I'm aware this may be a bit of a slightly political question uh, and of course you're not here to name names, but did you find that, you know, as you said, you have to take into account all of these different ministers, Ministry of Defense's um, opinions and, and, and needs. Mm -hmm. Did you find that since the war in Ukraine, Ukraine has been easier to federate um, all these different interests or that hasn't changed too much yet? I mean, there is, there is a momentum mm. at EU level. Uh, yeah. that uh, everybody is involved. Uh, the, the threat is common. We've seen a lot of uh, changes in policy in country that were more on, on a pacifist uh, orientation that were more, more, are, more, are more concerned about their security environment. Yeah. So of course we, we, we see a momentum growing. But then for us at EDA we have this thing where we are very flexible into uh, the w with the framework we give member states to interact with in, basically. Uh, we have uh, we, we, we have a CAT A project, CAT B project. I'm not going to go into the techniques, but just to explain that with those frameworks, you can have a project in which everybody is involved. Mm -hmm. Everybody can go. You have you can have other project in which you have only a few member states that wish to cooperate on one specific things and allocate funding accordingly. So we have a very flexible structure for cooperation. Uh, that, uh, that, that makes that, uh, we and we had that before, I would say. Mm -hmm. So regarding involvement of member states, of course we see a momentum, but then everybody is able to do what they are looking for within this framework. Yeah, makes sense. And you have to be flexible when it comes to European yeah. Union. Sure. <laughs> now, uh, I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities to come back to you, uh, but we've, we've explored a little bit what the European Defence Agency is doing to, <coughs> you know, uh, increase cooperation and facilitate this cooperation. Now, before you start telling us a bit more of what could potentially be more challenging, uh, Paola, um, can you just remind me a little bit what the Foresight Analyst at Navantia does, what your role is? Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, so I'm what um, my friends call the news girl. <laughs> so I just <laughs> have to be on top of everything. Um, so I do what I uh, divide into three buckets, so a little bit of the day-to-day -day news, everything that's happening um, on that smaller level that is coming out every day. Then I, uh, the larger bucket is I um, do a lot of analysis of government uh, documents, so where be it at EU level or other countries, and that can be um, a lot of budget analysis, uh, dif different def defense budgets, or a uh, comparison, for example, on e ESG criteria. Um, the US and the UK, for example, have specific ESG criteria now for their ministries of defense, so a little comparison on sort of what they're doing, where they're going, and where the European Union I is, 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 go is trying to go. Um, and then on a other larger analysis, just more um, sort of the environment and defense uh, 
a future trends, defense or not, uh, sort of where we're going, uh, what is going to be changing, um, how is energy, for example, going to change from here to 2030 to 2050, um, how is all of this momentum after the Ukraine war, is that going to keep going uh, from here to 2030? What's that really going to look like? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we've already seen a change from this year to last year, and it's only only sadly uh, already been two years since the war. Um, so what is what are those changes going to look like? Uh, how's technology evolving? What types of technologies should, should we be more concerned about or less concerned about? Um, and with uh, it devel uh, developing so quickly, what will it be critical for, for example, the naval domain, defense domain, but also largely just, you know, uh, globally, uh, what are we really looking at? Okay, so, yeah. yes, you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> I am. <laughs> so, uh, with all these documents that you're reviewing, all these news that you're, you know, analyzing, what have you seen as the main challenges in terms of European cooperation in the defense industry? Yeah. There's a lot, <laughs> not going to lie, but I think the key one is uh, that we should consider whether um, higher cooperation in defense will mean uh, member states losing sovereignty um, in their in, a, in some of their decisions um, because we're looking to co cooperate more in a lot of areas. So do we want joint procurement? That's going to require a lot of coordination and that's going to require ministries of defense to be a little more transparent on what they want and what they're looking for. Um, traditionally, member states have been more reticent to do that, right? So if we're looking to go um, to the level of cooperation that the European Union is sort of pushing for, then that means um, certain things for member states that they're going to have to be okay with. Um, on, you know, that that's if we're willing to go all the way. If we're not and we're staying here, then that's fine. But then maybe we're not talking about uh, full co cooperation. And then... I mean, there's so many, for example, we can we can also just uh, take into consideration the east-west divide, right? Eastern mm -hmm. and c central and eastern Europe and western Europe um, are not the same for many reasons. And one of them is the type of uh, weapon systems that they that their industries procure. But another uh, very real reason is uh, their risk assessment regarding especially now the security situation in Europe. Uh, we've seen this quite uh, significantly, if you look at their defense budgets, um, Eastern European countries have incremented the, their defense budgets considerably uh, in percentage wise, quite a lot more than Western, Western European nations mm. because their risk assessment is much higher, right? Because they're right at the doors um, of Russia and, and much closer to Ukraine. They've also had to, um, well, uh, accept a lot of immig immigrants from Ukraine, of course, displaced persons. Um, and so all of that translates to European def defense industry and sort of what we're doing and, and how each of us sort of what we, you were mentioning in the previous question with Mark, like how are we all coordinating that, right? If we're really talking about different things. Sustained investment. So for example, we've had um, We've had a lot of impetus in the last few years and a lot of things have come up and a, a lot of plans that the EU has put forward in uh, increasing funding for in, uh, innovation and uh, pr joint procurement and other things. But um, if I'm building a ship, I'm building a ship for five or 10 years. So in 10 years, am I gonna have funding not only for this one ship, but to continue the class, right? If you want six, then you know that's, a, that's long-term planning. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's great that we're now focusing more on defense and I think it's quite necessary and we can go into that if you want, but, mm -hmm. um, but then I need to know in just, uh, as industry, I need to know if this is going to continue or if states down the line are going to be like, well, this is situation has stabilized and actually I need to repurpose this money for other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's actually a really good segue into seeing what, you know, if you've seen these kind of trends as well, or these kind of questions is emerge at MBDA and or TALIS. And I'm, g I'm getting a lot of yes from you, yes. Cecilia. Well, I'm sure we are uh, all aware of that uh, those of us working in defense uh, live in challenging time. And, and I'm sure we, we all agree that the role of uh, European cooperation is, is more important than, than ever. Uh, not only for its uh, traditional area of responsibilities, but uh, also in, in defense area and protecting our countries uh, in the current unstable landscape. 
And uh, I mean, this is especially true in, uh, in naval domain. Um, for example, we've seen uh, modern submarine becoming an increasing uh, threat, um, threatening major assets, uh, operate in littoral waters, for instance. And uh, this has brought back, for instance, the anti-submarine warfare uh, backup on mm -hmm. our agendas. Mm -hmm. Uh, in naval domain, uh, there is as well um, uh, mine uh, warfare, uh, and, and here we see uh, mine uh, that will become, that are becoming, sorry, more sophisticated and uh, very affordable. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, truly a risk for uh, individual countries, but for our European Union. And maybe the last, uh, the last domain I would name uh, that have recently brought such a renewed interest mm -hmm. is seabed mm -hmm. warfare. Yes. And, and well, seabed and what lies on them, such as like telecoms, cable, power, and, and so on, are unexplored territory, but reachable by unfriendly and by unmanned technologies. So mm -hmm. I would say, uh, yes, uh, we are living in very challenging time and, and I believe uh, European cooperation is one of the way to answer those challenges because, I mean, we need to be together to tackle those, those points and we need to be together to develop uh, capabilities that are ahead of mm -hmm. our potential aggressors mm -hmm. and it means for me cooperation and, and innovation, mm -hmm. so clearly. Yeah. What about you, Stefano? Did you want to add something? About? About uh, all the points that uh, Paola was raising, about the fact that also there can be sometimes a bit of a, um, not necessarily short attention span, but, you know, like attracted to the light for the funding. So, you know, we're talking about seabed warfare now, so funding's going there. We're talking about mine warfare, so funding's going there. I think that what is important is to have a vision, mm -hmm. it's to have a long-term vision. It's not to say, ah, oh, it's what is important is this or that. It's to have like the, the compass, mm. to have a, a global vision for 10, 15 years. Why it's important to have a global vision? It's because also it's related to investment. Mm -hmm. Where should I invest? Which kind of technology? You are talking about innovation. And if you want to be a step ahead, you need innovation anyway, yeah. in cyber, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, whatever. And that's the, uh, to give the, uh, the, the right direction where you should, uh, you should invest. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important. Of course, you can always make a snapshot of what's going on right now. But I think what is very important, it's not only having this snapshot, but to think about the future. Mm -hmm. If I look at MBDA, just to give you an example, uh, when in 2002, we launched uh, the Meteor, the air-to-air -air missile to have superiority it's because at that time people had a vision mm -hmm. that you never know what the USSR could be one day. Eh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's or just anyone. to give you an example. Eh? Yeah. And uh, now, of course, it's in service, eh? but it's just because people had a vision, a strategy at that time that we have such a weapon nowadays. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to have a vision. Of course, all the eyes are watching what's going on in Russia and it's new mm -hmm. because some years ago, if you talk about what's going on for Spanish forces, it was much more North Africa, etc., the, the region of interest, and that's normal. If you are going to Poland, of course, the region of interest was already here uh, mm. uh, around Russia. But what has changed is that everybody's focusing right now on what's going on, uh, what's going on in Ukraine. <coughs> but you have to think more, more than that. What is interesting also in Ukraine is the way people are fighting. Mm -hmm. In some cases, it's like the First World War with trenches, etc. Uh, secondly, what is also interesting is asymmetric warfare, mm -hmm. hybrid warfare, etc., etc. And I think all those terms now are very common and well spread. Uh, within the European uh, community. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, uh, very, very uh, interesting, yeah. to my view. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. And also what is very <laughs> interesting, it's to get the support from the population, clearly. Yes. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, for, for them, war was a distant uh, noise, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Mm -hmm. It's not true. Yeah, not anymore. So, it, uh, it, I think they... Uh, it federates the way uh, people think the external environment of, uh, of Europe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And, and the big move is also uh, the European institution. 
uh, the European Commission talking about different topics, etc. That's what changed the whole paradigm, I think. Eh? Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's really my, uh, my vision. Yeah. No, I get it. And I saw that uh, Paola was uh, wanting yeah, to... Yeah, actually, um, you mentioned the key point, which is um, the strategic compass, for example, was the first time that the European Union put on paper uh, a set an assessment of risks and concerns that the whole of the European Union had, right? This had usually been done uh, like the United States does its uh, national security mm. um, strategy um, on an individual basis. But if we're trying to act as a whole, right, and the benefit of the European Union is that you can get the set of 27 countries acting as one, um, and you're trying to act coherently in defense matters, but you don't have an analysis of what your main areas of concern are, that's going to be problematic. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so that's improved in, in the strategic compass, I mean, was published in, in March of 2022. So um, the timing was a little, um, well, Not things bad. had changed, <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, it was, but it was important for that reason, right? And so moving forward, some of the things that we've seen the European Union do is put a, do a lot more of that, of saying these are things that are important for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and these are things you can focus on. And for industry, that's quite important because it's like if I'm preparing long term and I'm going to need to build, say, more submarines or more frigates or anything else, and I know that you're already interested in that technology, then that's easier for me to know that I'm focusing on this. Mm. And most recently, as part of the economic security strategy, um, they've published a number of things, and one of them is the, a list of critical technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and that's quite fundamental for a lot of things that are happening right now, right? And, and one of the areas that they're focusing is a lot of underwater uh, technology. Um, and and sonar and and lasers etc in addition to of course like artificial intelligence and quantum and mm -hmm. and um, semiconductors and other things but that's a very clear guidance on all of the countries that are that belong to European Union are concerned about these things and we're going to prioritize technologies and um, R&D and other things uh, to ensure that we can procure this on a European level and not depend on other countries too much as our own su only suppliers of these technologies. And that's just one area where we've said, you know, we can get together and, and set this as one of our priorities. And mm -hmm. that's really fundamental. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing, oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and to, 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 to react to everything that's been said, because it's very interesting, uh, because the, the current situation is, is uh, characterized by what you also describe as a mix of uh, the need for high-end capabilities to fight uh, peer adversary, high-intensity warfare. <laughs> But also going back to technologies that were kind of out of fashion, if you take uh, all the debate around main, main battle tank at the beginning of the, of the Russian war, Ukrainian war. So, so it's, 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 it kind of deformed the whole capability building exercise because you still have those long term projects, but also you kind of, okay, what is warfare nowadays and how to really engage in it. Uh, and so you have also this mix of short term, long term. And we've seen this, I would say, we felt it in uh, also the, the process we, we put in place at EDA, for example, the CARD process. Mm -hmm. Again, another acronym. <laughs> uh, the Coordinate Annual Review on Defense, mm -hmm. which is really, I it's, it's what we're talking about right now. It's, it's like uh, going to member states, each and every one of them, and identify their capability uh, planning uh, perspective and try to uh, uh, get harmony and, and like, um, uh, like basically uh, put everything on the, on the table, mm -hmm. what everybody is planning to, in, in what kind of uh, direction, uh, what are the time frames for it, what the investment and everything, and say, okay, you are doing the same thing as your neighbor or this guy also across Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe there's something you can do together. Uh, this is a part of the uh, um, card exercise that we call the collapse, collaborative opportunities, mm -hmm. uh, in which there is a defense industry dimension in which we engage to try to say, okay, not, not only do you have this common interest, uh, you can plan in the long term together, but you also have the relevant industry to actually really cooperate and also build, I would say, value mm -hmm. for your companies. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we felt this kind of moving, I would say, uh, uh, environment uh, that you described very well um, in, in our coordination tool, but they also, also, I would say, well built to take them into account. Yeah. Okay, so there is movement definitely for a bit more of a as I said, strategic compass, but uh, to use another word, uh, have a more common direction uh, at a European Polarization. 
Polarization. Yeah, well, polarization is a bit too specific, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely. So before moving on to something else, did you have any other challenges that you've seen that you really wanted to highlight? I know that Mark also <laughs> spoke about um, the issues, the challenges with qualified personnel. Uh, is that s at all something you've noticed as well? Yeah, I would. Um, yeah, let's start with qualified personnel. I think that's really key because, for example, if we're talking about an increase in uh, defense funds, which means a growing industry of defense, um, we don't have enough people to man that growing industry mm -hmm. of defense, right? So yes, this is great. We'll have more money in the future, but are we um, educating enough people to work at all levels of this, right? Uh, this means really technical profiles, but these, this means uh, higher up profiles as well, mm -hmm. um, just better versed in how everything that we're talking about, right? All of us here have been in the doing this for for a little bit of time, and, and it takes a little bit of time to be able, you know, to understand all the acronyms and to understand how everything <laughs> interrelates and to know which countries are focused on what. And and so, um, and so the, there, there aren't, and there are also a, a separate a problem is uh, on a military level, are we recruiting enough to actually be able to man all the platforms mm -hmm. that we're talking about? You know, I can build seven submarines. Can you, man. do you ha can you man seven submarines? Yeah. You know? yeah. um, and so it's sort of a duality. And, and I think the, the European U Union as a whole is quite aware of it, um, but it is a very real problem right now. And then if I had to mention a, a, a one more is, is sort of challenges to supply lines that we've seen. Um, you know, with COVID and, and with the war in Ukraine. Um, and the, Euro the European Union has taken in, uh, that into account and, and is actually um, as part also of the um, economic security strategy, um, cr done the um, Critical Raw Materials Act, um, which sort of looks to um, not depend on any one country for more for more than 65% of uh, the supply for a certain material. Right. And this focus is specifically on defense and on uh, clean energy technologies, which are the ones that depend most on raw materials. Mm -hmm. um, so we're also looking to, you know, taking that into account as well as joint procurement of certain materials to ensure that we have enough supply and we don't get to, to any, any critical. Th so it will be a challenge moving forward, but, um, but we're starting on both of these fronts to sort of, we are aware of the problem and are trying to do something about it, but there are still challenges. Okay. Well, I know we have also the opportunities coming up, but before that, I want to seize the opportunity to move uh, to our uh, two industry uh, leaders here today. We have a question actually from the uh, from the audience, and I think it's a perfect segue. Um, they're asking if we can have examples of joint procurements that have worked out well. Uh, they're saying, looking at the latest developments between the Netherlands and Germany, there will be no further cooperation for the next anti-air frigates due to fundamental differences. So... Um, well aware. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah, yeah, apparently, yes. So uh, perhaps, Cecilia, do you want to give us a few examples from Thales? Yes, I can take, uh, I can take the question and, uh, and answer by a few examples. So in Thales, we have, uh, I would say, extensive experience uh, of the European collaboration uh, in its traditional ways through the uh, uh, traditional uh, procurement agencies. And I think this is uh, the way the question is, uh, is asked. So I would name some of those contractual agencies. Uh, for example, we have OCAR, we have uh, NAIMA, we have uh, Eurotorp uh, to stay within the naval domain. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in Thales, uh, through OCA, we have the uh, mine countermeasure uh, program called MMCM uh, in cooperation with uh, UK uh, and in France. Uh, we have as well the uh, FREM program that was contracted through uh, OCA in 2005. Uh, to design the new frigates matching French and Italian uh, Navy requirements. So I think this is one example of a joint uh, contractual uh, program um, that ended into a, a procurement. And more than uh, one shot procurement, for example, if we take the example of the French program, it has been followed by uh, export uh, contract mm -hmm. of this uh, frigate design. Yeah, absolutely. 
And what about from the point of view of MBDA? So first of all, uh, MBDA is a European company. So cooperation is our DNA, huh? yes. basically. And you know MBDA, we have UK solution, French, Italian, German, and a little bit of uh, Spanish. So those are our domestic customers. And apart from that, it's true that we have changed momentum in working with the EU uh, institution to launch uh, new, uh, new programs that are in, uh, in cooperation. And not only new programs, but sometimes procurements, uh, procurements of Mistral uh, Vichorat system, uh, jointly with different uh, European uh, uh, countries uh, that will help having a, a better better price at the end of the day. Huh? Mm -hmm. So we are using OCA, we are using various institutions, in fact, uh, for having the best, uh, the, the best, value, uh, best value for money. Now in, term of, uh, now in term of cooperation and uh, trying to answer to the, uh, the question. So first of all, I've been working on this topic for the past three years, so I know a little bit. I won't comment, of course, on the decision whether or not uh, to go uh, further between the, uh, the Dutch and the German cooperation. I won't comment all that. But the point is, in some cases in Europe, some countries are looking at what's available from European manufacturer. Mm -hmm. That's what I've changed also my view in the past five to ten years. And especially thanks to the Trump administration, what has changed is that European are much more looking what do we have that can match our requirement. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the capabilities that we have in Europe are huge. And sometimes, for good or bad reasons, European countries are buying from outside of uh, the EU. That's, that's one point. And we can talk about this uh, all afternoon if you need. What is interesting also, because we are talking about naval environment, what is interesting is that also for MBDA in the naval domain, that's what I'm dealing with every day. We are working with various industry all around Europe. To give example, uh, Navantia, uh, Naval Group, of course, the TKMS, uh, Fincantieri, BA System, etc. So MBDA, we are used for years now because we are the European missile manufacturer mm -hmm. to work with various companies all around Europe, whether it's Thales in France or in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. So we are really used to work with all of them. What is important to bear in mind also is that the balance for our industry is our domestic customer, but not only, also the international uh, customer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We were talking about ramping up the, the production to ramp up the production, you need to have a production going on. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, you don't have, if you don't have a procurement from your domestic customer, then you need to deliver for, for an ally, mm -hmm. uh, meaning an export customer, etc. Mm -hmm. And that's the balance I've seen also in Navantia for the past 10, 15 years, trying to balance with domestic procurement and international, uh, international procurement. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, roughly the same, uh, the same for, for Thales. Yeah. And I think it's important to bear in mind. And for MBDA, honestly, uh, we need to develop much more in European countries that are not our domestic customers. Mm -hmm. And it's true that uh, some of them are buying uh, from the US, the Israelis, etc. And, and, and we need to continue pushing, uh, having also uh, uh, explaining that it's better off, uh, they are better off uh, buying from a, a EU, uh, EU uh, industry mm -hmm. rather than uh, an external one. So that's, uh, that's uh, what we are pushing a lot. Cooperation, of course, it's our DNA but also cooperating with the larger industry, uh, naval industry, all around uh, Europe. Mm. So we've talked a lot until now, actually, of you know, the relationship between you know, the EU and well, the European uh, funds and all the European tools and the industry. What I'm wondering now, when it ties into one of the questions that we received as well, is what is the positive outcome for an, from an industrial point of view of cooperating with other industry partners across Europe. And, you know, the follow-up question to that, which is the one that we received as well, is that if there are so many positive outcomes and opportunities, and we're coming back to opportunities as well, why does it go wrong uh, sometimes? sometimes? <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> so maybe, uh, maybe I can answer a little bit and then uh, you, uh, I can pass the... Uh, first of all, uh, in some cases, uh, the, um, the budget you need mm -hmm. for developing a new, new weapon system, uh, sometimes it's not affordable by a single country. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, uh, the A400M or whatever, it's been funded by multiple countries. It's the same for, same for weapon system. Advanced system cost a lot of money. In the past, we used to have national development on weapon system. And nowadays, it's much more a European approach. Uh, if you look at uh, the French uh, and Brits, with, after the Lancaster House agreement in 2010, uh, we are developing uh, weapons together. We are sharing the sovereignty, uh, because you talk about sovereignty, mm -hmm. that's a key aspect. And sovereignty is not understood sometimes in the same way eh, from different countries in Europe. Yeah. Strategic autonomy, it's not understand, understood also <laughs> in the same way all, all around Europe. That's the benefit uh, sometimes of having uh, EU uh, saying uh, that's the vision that I have when I speak about sovereignty. That's what I that, that's what I envisaged, and and, and I, I think I think it's very important to to bear in mind that uh, when you speak and you give a, a word, it's meaningless for uh, for some of the uh, the people, and it has a different sense, etc. Yes. So I think that's uh, that's that's very uh, very important. That's uh, that's my view. Yeah, absolutely. So I take, uh, I take the question as well, yeah. um, uh, just to uh, come back on the uh, EDF mechanisms. So to set the scene, uh, within Thales we are uh, largely involved in this uh, EDF project. So, so for an instance in uh, 2023 we were involved in 34 proposals, among which eight as a coordinator or as a leader. So this is, this is huge. Yes. And I would say one of the uh, key points of uh, why we go uh, into this, uh, this kind of project is, first of all, we are strongly supported by our French Ministry of Defence. Mm. And uh, they are supporting us because they see the result as a direct benefit for the national roadmaps. So this is f first, uh, first point. Second point is because of this uh, cooperation mechanism that you just explained, we are more or less forced, push to work with usual competitors, which, challenging, which, is, which is a challenge for ourselves, for industry, but it, in a way it's good for competitiveness, but also to speed up our innovation uh, funnel. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it, 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 it's really uh, also a win-win, I would say, situation, because we are learning for, from our partners, from large groups, but for, from also from smaller players, from academics, from SMEs, and they are also learning from, from us. Mm. So together we are really um, fostering uh, innovation and, and contributing to um, uh, growing the research or the awar awareness of one topic. Mm -hmm. um, so as industry and, and within Thales, we really see also the benefit of going into those EDF projects if they are followed by a procurement program. Mm -hmm. And here I would say it's a bit of a drawback because very often we have too little visibility on the after EDF. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a difficult point because uh, as industry, it's it requires time and resources to go into this kind of project. Mm -hmm. So if we decide to go into this kind of project because we want to learn, we want to invest, we want to be uh, together with our French Ministry of Defense or uh, whatever Ministry of Defense, it is to conclude in something and, and the something, the object uh, is a bit too much undefined, mm -hmm. so maybe all the A's up and mm -hmm. the <laughs> and, and so on will answer this question. But uh, I will say this is a main drawback currently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which also ties into what Paola was saying before. You were saying the, vis la the lack of visibility sometimes for yep. these systems can be a, a real problem, a real issue. So 
what you know based on some of the issues that we're also discussing are there what are the opportunities where are you seeing as well like also they, they're saying that it's really good also for to learn from other partners to learn or sometimes also to be challenged i'm assuming in some of these projects you must be the challenging sparring partners so what opportunities have you seen from your point of view as yeah a well for one i would start with um sort of the development of a european framework um, which Mark has already started commenting on. There's a lot more there. Um, and the European Union has been quite clear on what it intends these programs to be for. Mm -hmm. um, the execution, you know, that we can, ha we can have, have challenges with the execution, but the, but the reason to, to develop a lot of these programs and, and what they are intended to do has been quite clear. And that's really helpful. Um, so we have that. Uh, and if, you, if, if anybody needs details, I'm happy to go into it. Um, the second is, you know, on, um, a war will create, will create demand growth in the defense industry, right? Um, and Ukraine requires very specific needs that we can plan for. Um, and that's helpful for industry to be able to, be able to do that. You know, un unfortunately, uh, there is a war, but <laughs> we supply it so um, and and so any demand increase will will require growth of the industry on, at all levels of industry and that's something we hadn't had in the European industry actually since after the 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 Cold War it, it's been a decrease in in the operate op operations of uh, most industry and so you know that's that's an opportunity there's a lot of growth that can happen and with growth uh, we can have we can accelerate jump procurement, we can boost production capabilities, we can do a lot of things. Um, and actually, which I forgot, um, you know, Ursula von der Leyen has indicated the, the desire to include Ukraine's uh, industry as well it, as part of this mechanism, uh, uh, you know, this whole ecosystem. So, you know, we're happy to also count with that. We'll also help them in their development um, and sort of sustain you know, not only their capabilities, but their their economy at large. Um, and, you know, it helps collaboration. There's a lot of cross-talent development and a lot of um, knowledge sharing. So, you know, anytime I'm collaborating with anyone on, uh, you know, if, Na if Navantia is collaborating with, um, say, Naval Group on, on a ship, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of, at the design level that we're cooperating, but later at building, we're also having, you know, cross talent development um, and a lot of knowledge sharing. And this is how I do this part, and this is how you do this part. Um, and so that just, in general, creates a lot of um, synergies. Right. So with all these pretty positive aspects to collaboration, I'm going back to the initial question: Why does sometimes why doesn't it work? Uh. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, European cooperation is not that easy because for most of the countries, you have a phasing, you have a timeline, mm. you have to put a budget in place, etc. So it's matching budget requirement. Uh, of course, at the very beginning, uh, the global operational requirement, for example, for MBDA to have a single weapon system that can match multiple need. That's one point. But then secondly, having the budget huh, for various countries, having the proper work share, mm. because people are asking, uh, if I go to Spain, they are asking for work share, etc. So having the proper work share, it takes time. It takes time also to find the right company uh, to do this or this or that. I think we are used to, because uh, if you look, uh, I was speaking about a meteor missile. We are manufacturing in Spain, bits of the missile in everywhere all around Europe. So you get used to uh, the uh, uh, development, technological, industrial base that you have in Europe and you work with people, etc. But this momentum of working with people, not only buying, procuring from a, a French company, etc. It takes time to do so. It takes time to change the mentality yeah, and to go for a European, uh, a European solution. Mm. And uh, uh, that's, that's really my view. You need to get used to it. You need to uh, go all around Europe. It's facilitated through uh, Brussels, because when you go in Brussels, etc. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's very important. And of course, uh, uh, cooperation sometimes will induce a more complex uh, outcome or issues, uh, etc. But the benefit 
is to uh, reduce the uh, budget uh, for a single country. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, uh, that's uh, the, that's one of the uh, that's one of the main reason. Something also that is very important is that through the European Fund, etc., you have incentive. You have incentive to work uh, and to find partners, etc., in Europe, mm -hmm. and that's really a, a good uh, a good move huh? mm -hmm. uh, because the people, industry, is trying to catch those funds uh, in order to uh, to move on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the globally what's going on for uh, at the, this time. If I take a snapshot, is very good because it's going in the right uh, right direction. Mm. If I had to say one word about that, and of course people can always say, uh, you have any experience about what happened for such and such a program in cooperation. But I think if I look at naval uh, cooperation around frame, the, the frame frigate, etc., it was a, a good cooperation, the horizon frigate, uh, etc., etc. It's true that in Europe our industry is fragmented. I'm not talking about MBDA because we are the, the big uh, missile manufacturer in Europe. I'm talking about radars. Mm -hmm. How many naval radars do we have in Europe mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. compared to the US? Yeah. In the US, you have two radar manufacturers in, in the US. We have uh, tens of them. Yeah. Mm. They are all very good. Huh? And it's sovereignty, uh, one more time. Huh? They are all very good. And, and that's the other click. Huh? It's when all this will disappear. It's yeah. not for tomorrow, I can tell you. Huh? Uh, it's the same for shipyard. Huh? How many shipyards do we have in Europe? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So as long as the various countries can fund all this, it's perfect. Huh? <laughs> uh, of course, EPC, for example, European Platform, uh, the European program, uh, COVID program, it, 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 it's, it's very good because it helps through Naviesa. It helps uh, people also work together, trying to find uh, uh, bits that uh, would be useful uh, for a French Corvette or uh, Spanish Corvette, etc. That's that's very good. Mm -hmm. Again, it's mentality. Yeah. Mm. Well, so I like that you mentioned the radars because it's the perfect opportunity to uh, move on to, although you were mostly underwater uh, in your career, but to move on to Thales as well. What, um, from your point of view, from what you've seen, maybe also from some of the projects that you've been on, what can go wrong sometimes and you know, what can be done to avoid that maybe? Mm -hmm. So I, I would like to underline what, uh, what Stefano was saying. I think indeed our industry in Europe is fragmented. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think we are afraid of competitors mm -hmm. and that's why we are very cautious on uh, intellectual property rights mm -hmm. when it comes to those uh, projects in cooperation. Mm -hmm. So work share is indeed something but then it is about IP. IPR indeed mm -hmm. what do we do from the result mm -hmm. who is able to exploit those results in which context and so on so I know that within Thales we are uh, of course cooperating with, uh, with, with players in front of us but we are very cautious about what do we develop inside those projects, what do we want to share, what we don't want to share, what we are not allowed to share by our uh, Ministry of Defence because of uh, sovereignty. Uh, and this is especially the true on, on, on seabed domain that I was mentioning earlier. Um, however, <laughs> I would like to, uh, to talk about one uh, project that uh, just uh, ended, an EDF project just, that just ended. Um, it's called uh, CNICE uh, and it was federated by, by Thales around uh, 16 uh, partners. Mm -hmm. um, and this project was about uh, defining the future of anti-submarine uh, warfare. So what will be the future of uh, anti-submarine warfare? Uh, tackling drones and classical assets. And what was incredible into this, in, inside this project uh, is that six navies worked together to define the future CONOPS. Mm -hmm. So here there was no question of uh, industrial rights, and, but, but really defining the concept of operation. Mm -hmm. And I think this really worked well. Um, and as well, the industry defined together the underlying architecture principles and some uh, autonomy modules mm -hmm. um, that will help uh, in, in the future of anti-submarine. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example, great example of uh, success in cooperation um, because I would say it stays at CONOPS uh, 
technological bricks, uh, and this is quite easy to, to share and, uh, and to work together on, on, on those kind of topics. Mm -hmm. Okay, which is interesting that you're mentioning um, <coughs> Amman systems because we had a question also from the from the audience uh, who was asking when it comes to platform design is there a common aspiration uh, from from the EU from the EDA from DG Defis and the different shipyards to reflect on propulsion design for manned and unmanned platforms considering a sustainability requirements and b the higher demand of energy with regards to the systems installed on them like direct energy weapons um, so, who would like to go first? Would you? Well, at w I will provide a, a partial answer yeah. uh, because we are uh, we just uh, were awarded um, from uh, from EDA uh, on a project called um, Euroguard, led by our, our colleague from Estonia. Uh, and the goal of this project is indeed to uh, design and prove at sea a medium-sized semi-autonomous uh, surface vehicle um, with the main focus on energy. So indeed there is one project in cooperation where several players will be around the table to, 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 to put their effort together yeah. and, and build something, build an unmanned uh, surface vehicle with energy consumption in mind uh, and demonstrate at sea, so. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not bypassing you, uh, Stefano, but I will ask Paola first. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Because I know you've talked also about sustainability and things like that. Yeah, um, I think it's the area that is getting um, a lot of funding right now. Um, and it, and I will say more than a lot of, well, a lot of focus um, because we've sort of mastered all the other areas. You know, we, we know how to build a frigate, we know how to build a submarine, etc. cetera. Um, and there's a lot of innovation that is going on to this area. So how do we do it? Uh, what type of, of underwater vehicles do you need? How large is it? How small is it? And, and that's not only at the EU level, that's worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of, of innovation and development going into this area to sort of expand um, what it means and, and sort of where do we want to go with this? Uh, you know, what, uh, what type of, of underwater sea vehicles work for which type of submarine, mm -hmm. um, for what type of mission, for what type of ocean? Um, all these things are questions that we still uh, need to explore a lot more and we have a lot of newer technology that allows us to explore all of these different areas, you know. Um, and, and energy is a key one for, you know, with, the, with a lot of the uh, thing, con conversation around energy um, is, is, you know, if you have the technology to sort to to build them with uh, nuclear uh, reactors inside, right? With, um, of course, that's only some countries, but that will give you a lot of autonomy for that system. So can they, um, can they receive back information? How far can you go? How much can you lose? Uh, can you use them you know, for ISR? Or do you want to use them for other things? So it's a really interesting question. And I think there's a lot of R&D going on in this. Um, and we will see a lot more in the coming years. Yeah, absolutely. And Stefano, I know you were, we were also talking off the record today about direct energy weapons. Yeah. Um, so what's your take on this? And is there like a I European sort of momentum? Yeah. <coughs> to answer, uh, well, uh, I'm not a shi uh, shipbuilder, but clearly to answer the question, things will change in the future due to the, the power requirement, et cetera, for, for such a system, it's true. Yeah. When you have 200 kilowatt uh, laser on board a ship, uh, it's not the same uh, as having missile, for example. Yeah for which you need less, less energy, of course, from the ship. And it's true that uh, people are thinking a lot about uh, energy, uh, uh, power supply, what will be the future in terms of uh, uh, propulsion, in terms of uh, energy for, for weapon systems on board a ship, etc. I think there are multiple, uh, multiple innovation uh, around uh, all this, as far as I've understood, mm -hmm. as far as I've understood uh, uh, but we are not a specialist of uh, what's uh, on board a uh, ship, uh, honestly. We are only uh, weapon uh, manufacturers. But it's true that uh, I it's a new paradigm huh? when you think about um, uh, laser, when you pay seek, uh, think about uh, directed energy weapon, etc. It's a new paradigm on a ship uh, because you, you need to install on board uh, mm. uh, 
you have safety aspects, you have all that kind of uh, thing, Space. and and you have people on board the ship, uh, etc. So manning. Uh, yeah, and, and are uh, they trained to yeah. be able to use these platforms? Exactly. <laughs> But I think uh, around laser, what is important also, it's the, the conops. Huh? You were speaking about the conops, uh, uh, because the, the, the laser won't stop. Huh? The laser won't stop in the air. A missile would stop at a certain range, huh? but the laser won't stop. So yeah. what, which kind of damage? Huh? Yeah. Uh, so we are, star we are starting low, very low. And you know that MBDA, uh, uh, we are working, of course, uh, on laser in France, uh, UK and Germany for, for some time. In France with SILAS, huh? mm -hmm. uh, with low, uh, low power, low LMAP, uh, with low power uh, laser. But there is a roadmap. I think there is a huge interest from uh, most of the uh, navies yeah. because the, you can use it in brackets unlimited time yes. and uh, compared to a missile. And uh, I think that's a huge interest mm -hmm. and also huge interest from what you have seen uh, in, in Ukraine against asymmetric threat. Uh, what about having uh, 10, uh, 10 UAVs uh, uh, coming towards you? What are you going to do? Uh? You're not going to fire mm -hmm. Aster missile uh, all day long. Uh? Yeah. So, so I think that uh, asymmetric warfare also people uh, will continue working uh, on this and then you will have constraints. Uh, for combat, uh, combat system integration, uh, compatibilities, uh, blah, 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 on board, uh, on board ship, uh, that's, uh, that's a big, uh, uh, that's quite difficult. Plenty. Because the ship, it's quite small, huh? yeah. and you yeah. want to put everything on it. Huh? So, yes, there's only so uh, Radars, much. <laughs> powerful radars, etc. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, no, absolutely. it's a compromise. Huh? Plenty. Everything is a compromise. Yeah, plenty to think about and to compromise. <laughs> Definitely. The story of the EU, really. Um, so, unfortunately, as I had promised you, the time does fly when we're <laughs> sitting here. So, I'm thinking there's plenty for you to take away here from yeah, this session today. Sure. So, I really wanted to take these few minutes that we have left to uh, give you the floor and, you know, what are your takeaways? What are anything you want to comment on with what's been said? Thank you. Um, so a lot of uh, very interesting ideas have been have been shared, uh, and uh, I would like to maybe uh, uh, have kind of a synthesis. I think to build also cooperation and fruitful cooperation, and also uh, trustful uh, cooperation between partners, uh, it's also supported by um, the creation of sort of a common culture. Mm. And uh, when you said strategic autonomy is not the same in every country, that's very true. But it's starting to to kind of melt, more or less. Uh, we see a lot of initiatives at EU level have kind of reinforced or, or, or um, favored the uh, emergence of a common strategic grammar, I would say. Uh, and um, what you said also related to um, uh, supply chain resiliency, for example, the uh, Critical Raw Material Act or the CHIPS Act, or even the single market emergency instrument, are all very important staple regulation to build also this common understanding uh, of things. So. I would say we, 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 we are progressing in this regard in, in the development of a common understanding of the strategic context and uh, what, is n what needs to be done. Um, I will echo also uh, uh, my colleague in industry by saying we have, we have challenges. Uh, one big that has been talked about is duplication, fragmentation at EU level, uh, which is a, a result of history. If you look on the trend long enough, you see that it's getting better. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot, a lot needs to be done. And the big challenge that has been talked about also is a challenge of predictability mm -hmm. of demand. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a union where you have very rare other country who are multi-year planning, uh, such as France, the military planning law, uh, that are very, I would say, open and predictable processes of procurement, uh, it can be difficult to, to harmonize it and you, you will see discrepancies mm -hmm. within uh, joint procurement programs. So the, there is a big challenge in predictability. Uh, but yeah, no, I would say we are, we are making progress mm -hmm. in all the metrics that matter. I'm here to be optimistic as well. <laughs> it's my job. Huh? We need some of that. So in all the metrics that matter, I think we are making progress. Uh, and we are making progress also in the way we talk about them. Also, direct energy weapon is a great case. Uh, because it's, um, we've worked extensively on it and, uh, and also through the KSA activity to try and really landscape the, what's been done in EU level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and it encapsulates everything that is challenging, but that's, it's also an opportunity. Uh, you have uh, security of supply uh, issues because the materials come from outside the EU. You have uh, 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 a capacity that is in between R&T and operations because it's already being used mm -hmm. uh, somewhere. So there is a lot of room 
to do things together, for example, in, in such a case. But uh, yeah, no, things are looking good overall. So if there is a message that you would like to take to your team after today, is there <laughs> something in particular that you'd like to share with them? Well, first of all, that uh, EDA has a good reputation <laughs> among the uh, panels <laughs> member, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, great. I wasn't expecting anything less. Um, yes, no, this that's wasn't that's <laughs> that I feel that the tools are, are well designed enough. I mean, it w they were designed by the member states first and foremost, so of course it's well designed. But uh, the tools are flexible enough to allow for more cooperation within 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 this framework uh, that uh, that yeah the, the the role we are doing is more important than ever we have to keep on working in the same direction and uh, yeah that that's that would be my, my main takeaway and there's a very quick question I will take it because it's a relatively easy one uh, how can someone is asking how can we cooperate as a maritime academy with the EDA so um, maritime academy, meaning uh, a military academy. Uh, I'm giving you all I have. Okay, okay. <laughs> no, because depending on whether you are a R&T organization, mm -hmm. then the CapTex uh, under RTI are really your, your, your playground, because basically this is where uh, they all are. Okay. Uh, but then we also have a, a training uh, unit within my directorate, the IC directorate, that try to organize common training exercise that harmonize standards. Um, so maybe <laughs> there is room there yeah. uh, uh, for them, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then we also organize sometimes, uh, you know, uh, event, to try and uh, federate the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I can just plug something quickly, <laughs> but uh, we are doing a, a maritime week uh, at the end of March. Okay. Uh, so content uh, still uh, under planning, yeah. but I can already announce that we uh, will be have uh, industry days on the 21st and 22nd of March. Okay. Uh, for this maritime week, so yeah, this is the this is what we do. We do networking, engagement, have people talk to one another, and try to find you know synergies. And is this all happening in Brussels, or it's happening in Brussels? Okay. This one, okay. yes, absolutely. But we tend to move around. Uh, we move around member states, so nobody gets jealous. So <laughs> every time there's an event, we try to travel a bit and and uh, and yeah, circle around Europe and have every member state enjoy a bit of uh, of this networking factor. Great. Well, thank you so much. In fact, thank you very much, all of pleasure. you. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here today. And I have to say, I'm going, I'm going to be Miss Obvious here, but I, it was a pleasure to have a round table with three women, <laughs> outnumbering the men. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our own little we present can cope to with ourselves. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, it's been, it's been a great conversation. I know we could have gone on for much longer, uh, but we, uh, we will give ourselves and our audience a little break. And the next roundtable will be in uh, probably March next year, but stay tuned for the precise date. You will find us on LinkedIn, as always. And on behalf of everyone here and on behalf of the Euro Naval team, I would like to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and hopefully fruitful cooperation next year in 2024. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.